Hey everybody, welcome back to another round of engineering, and uh, yeah, let's get at it. I have prepared for you a couple of example problems dealing with both the capacitors and the inductors, just to get a sense of how to go at these things using our various techniques. And then uh, that'll lead into more complicated circuits involving capacitors, inductors, and resistors. So yeah, let's go ahead and get a shot at it. Take a stab at this problem. Got it. Sweet. The thing that I really want to emphasize to you today are uh, the initial conditions. Initial conditions. Now, your book discusses these in a slightly different manner, but at the end of the day, it's getting at the same thing. It's that at time equals zero, something happens to change the circuit. And so you are going to have to approach these problems from two standpoints, namely figuring out what the status of the inductors or the capacitors are prior to the opening of the switch, and then what the behavior of the circuit is after opening the switch. Now, these initial conditions, I would say, are these suckers, right? stuff that we've determined before the switch is opened. And then this side, this time greater than zero, we'll be looking at the time dependence, dependence of circuit response. So along with that, please bear in mind that our book uses the convention that capital I and capital V are time independent quantities. And so we should start using lowercase i and lowercase v. So I'll try to remain, keep with that convention. Well, okay. Well, we are asked to find the potential drop across the capacitor and please bear in mind that this will be a time dependent quantity once the switch is opened. So why don't we consider first of all the situation prior to opening of the switch. And prior to opening the switch, you would notice that you have a situation like this. Now I encourage you to draw out the circuit if you have trouble remembering but I will draw it like this. And the first question I should ask you is, why have I decided to ignore the capacitor completely in this situation of time less than zero? Yeah. yeah. Well, presumably this switch has been closed for a long, long time. And so what can you tell me about the current flowing through the branch containing the capacitor if that switch has been closed for a long time? There shouldn't be any current flowing through. And this is where our ideas about what capacitors and inductors do at short and long times will come in handy. Since this switch has been closed for a long time, you can think of the capacitor as being fully charged. And because of that, the current flowing through the capacitor must be equal to zero. And no charge goes down that branch, no current, I should say. And because of that, you can think of the capacitor as representing, rep, okay, I can't spell represent, represent a break in the circuit. So when I drew it, I just drew it without anything in there. Easy peasy. Now what we would like to do is use this circuit representation to find the difference in potential. A notice that is across the 50 kilo ohm resistor. 
right? That's the same potential drop as across the capacitor. And I will just label that V naught. We need to know that initial potential drop in order to complete the entire problem. Okay, well, let's go at it. You got it? I mean, hopefully you see you just have a current divider at this point. You have a current supply, two resistors, and just to refresh your memory, if you have a current divider, the current going through one resistor is the value of the other resistor divided by the sum of the two resistors times the source current. You can get that by applying KCL and KVL. I assume that you are comfortable with that at this point. So if we want, if we want the potential drop across the 50 ohm resistor, the 50 kilo ohm resistor, that would be the current flowing through that 50 kilo ohm resistor times the value of the 50 kilo ohm resistor. Well, the current going through that branch should be, I'll put R80 over, well, shoot, um, I guess to keep with my notation, I'll call this R80 plus R20 plus R70. And I'm just leaving it in terms of variables so we can kind of follow what I'm doing. Okay. Times your source current. There we go. And then multiplied by the 50 ohm resistor. Kilo ohm. So there we go. This is actually equal to the initial potential across the capacitor. Right, right at time equals zero, this would be the potential drop across that capacitor. Well, let's go ahead and plug in our numbers here. So right here we have 80 times 50, so that's 4,000. And then we have something like uh, 150 down here in the, uh, excuse me, 170. Oh, excuse me, this is a 50. So this is 150. And then you'd have something like 7.5 milliamps. Well, that's nice. This cancels out that. 4 times 7.5, well, that's 30. And so you get something like one-fifth of an amp. Or excuse me, not an amp, one-fifth of a volt. There we go. Good so far. So now we have figured out what is the potential difference across the capacitor at time equals zero. So we're not we're not done yet. Okay, we still need to find the time varying behavior after the switch is opened. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that. So now we can approach the situation however we want. Uh, of course, we have a 0 0.4 microfarad capacitor that's fully charged. And then we have our resistor. I believe this was 50. So we have our 50 kilo ohm resistor. And now we can just go at it. Right, we have the situation where we have a discharging capacitor, and so we can set up the differential equation. The idea being Kirchhoff's voltage law tells us the capacitor potential is equal to the resistor potential. Okay. And I guess technically I should make these lowercase v's at this point, so because they are time varying. And then we go ahead and we substitute in our entire rigmarole. Now you can remind yourself about the current is equal to the negative change of the capacitor charge. Okay. And so you can go through your whole rigmarole and we end up with the idea that the potential on the capacitor is equal to the initial potential 
times e to the negative t over rc. In other words, as time progresses, we indeed get, potential across the capacitor, we indeed get an exponential decay of the potential. Of course, if you say, hey, this is the charge, this is the potential of the capacitor, once you have that, you could use the relationship between the potential on a capacitor and its charge, excuse me again, lowercase q over c. And so you could plot, for example, the charge versus time. Right, there's just a scaling factor of the capacitance in there. Or, for example, if you want to know the current flowing through the resistor, again, you just take the potential difference across the resistor, which is equal to the potential difference across the capacitor, so I could use Vc again, and I would just divide it by R. And again, I would have pretty much the exact same shape as a function of time, except it's scaled by, I'll, I'll call it Vc over R. Right, this would have been Vc over C. Excuse me, not Vc over C, this would be C times Vc would be that scaling factor. Okay. Cool, huh? Okay, well, let's hit up another one. So here we go. So again, we have a situation where we have a switch that is being opened at time equals zero. And so go ahead, we have a potential V naught of T. Go ahead, take a stab, see if you can come up with the answer. You got it? Yeah, good, 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 good. So let's go ahead and let's first of all find out the initial conditions, the starting conditions for these capacitors. And initially, with the switch being closed, we have our potential supply. We have our 15K capacitor, excuse me, our 15K resistor. Now, for long times, so that switch has been closed for a long time, the capacitors are fully charged, and so all of my current flows through the resistors. We can ignore those branches containing the capacitors altogether. And so what do we have here? We can now determine the current running through the resistors, which means we can now determine the potential difference between the high and low sides of each of those resistors. And once I know the potential drop across the 40 and the 20, I now know the drops across each of my individual capacitors. So that should be enough to get us started. So let's go ahead. So we see here that we have three circuits in, or three resistors in series. And so through our ideas of combining resistors, we know that the current will be equal to the initial potential divided by all three of those resistors in series. So I guess we could put the sum of the resistors. So at the end of the day, we get V over, I'll leave this in terms of variables again. I realize that you're probably subbing in the numbers right away put R40 here. Or if you want a value, uh, let's see, again, this is 15, and we have 60, 75. This would give us something like one-fifth of an amp, All right? 15 divided by 75. Okay. Okay, so far? All right. So now we have to consider what happens after the switch is opened. The circuit looks dramatically different. We have now, when the switch is opened, all of a sudden our capacitors 
become the current sources. So I'll put my five microfarad capacitor here. And we have one resistor. And I'll go ahead and leave the, the uh, physical orientation of everything the same. So we have our 40K resistor here. We have our 20K resistor. And we have our one microfarad capacitor. One microfarad. And uh, yeah, let's go at it. Now we notice right away that the current through this loop, so let's go ahead and take this upper loop. We have this current flowing through and you notice that any charge leaving the capacitor goes through our 20K resistor. And in fact, if we come over here to where the junction is, we know that the current coming in from the left has to also be the same as the current going up. In other words, you could think of the two currents in each of these loops as kind of staying within their respective loops. Convince yourself that that's okay, but I'll call this current I1, actually I'll call it I5, and I'll call this one I1. So to tell you the truth, KCL is not going to be very helpful here, right? If we applied KCL, what we would get is I5 going in plus I1 going in equals I5 coming out plus I1 going out. All right, zero is equal to zero. I've seen more helpful equations in life. Yeah, so, okay, so KCL will not help us here, but let's go ahead and just, um, sure, we'll just apply KVL. Okay. Now, of course, you could apply node voltage, you could do all these other ones. I'm, I'll just apply KVL here. Okay. And I have two that I would like to consider. I have this upper one, this upper left one, which would tell me the potential of the five uh, microfarad capacitor must equal the potential, put those little tails on there, I mean for those to be lowercase, of the 20 ohm resistor. And so what this ends up giving us is something along the lines, excuse me, of the charge of the five microfarad capacitor divided by the capacitance is going to be equal to the negative charge on that capacitor times the resistance. So in some sense, we're dealing with just two circuits that happen to have the same node, connected at the same node. We already know what the solution to this sucker is. Right? The solution to this sucker would be that Q5, the charge on the capacitor, is going to be equal to the initial charge on the capacitor. Yeah, you got it. E to the negative T over, I'll call it C5, R20. Yeah, good. And what's left for us to figure out is what this is, that, that initial charge. Or if you prefer, since the question asks us about the potential, we can just divide both sides by the capacitance, right? Keep in mind that the potential is just the charge divided by the capacitance. So I could just simply write this as the initial of the five e to the negative t over C5 R20. Okay. Well, let's keep going. We're going to need to still know that drop. So we have that the potential on that five microfarad capacitor is the initial potential e to the negative t, and I put C5R20. There we go. And uh, yeah, 
we already know what this value should be. That is the initial conditions. So our potential here, now if we go back and look at our figure, we notice that the initial potential across the five microfarad capacitor is the same as the potential drop across the 20 ohm resistor. And so what could I put here? I could put that the source, V of the source, divided by all three of these resistors. So I had a 15 plus the R20 plus the R40. Okay. Forgot that. And then I could multiply that by my 20. This gives me, and I'm underlining it here, the initial potential drop across the capacitor. Right? The current times the resistance that's in parallel with that capacitor. And then we tack the rest of the sucker on, right? E to the T over C5 R20. Now here. Sometimes it helps to work in variables, sometimes not so much. I think here's one of those times where it helps out immensely. Go ahead, write down the potential drop across the one microfarad capacitor. You got it? Yeah, good, good. Hopefully you see that because we did this in terms of variables here, we can just take the exact same equation that we have. Right, go back through and review the analysis for this first part of the circuit, and you'll realize that we don't have to do anything fancy to analyze the second loop. The only thing that we need to do is rather than using the R20 and the five microfarads, so I'm gonna leave this the same, Rather than using that R20, we now use the R40. And rather than using the five microfarads, we'll use the one microfarad. So yes, we've changed a couple of parameters, but the overall approach hasn't changed at all. We can just repurpose the same answer that we already had. Okay, pretty cool, huh? And now we are finally at our position. Let's go ahead and sub in numbers. Uh, so we said that the current is one fifth. And so what will this give us at the end of the day? We have something that says one fifth times, well, we have this 20K. Oh, no, excuse me. This one fifth, um, I guess it's one over 5K, excuse me, times 20K. And then we have this e to the negative t divided by five microfarads times 20k. So that would give me, let's see, the five times 20 gives me 100. And then it'll be 100 to the negative third. So I get something that says 0.1. Okay. Or if you prefer, if we cancel out some things. 4e to the negative 10t. And similarly down here, what will we have? Well, we have the 1 over 5k times the 40k. So that will give me 8. We have our e to the negative. Well, let's see. We have 1 microfarad times 40 kilo ohms. And so we should end up with something like 0 0.004, right? The, the 10 cancels the negative three. Oh, yeah, you should yell at me, right? Got an extra zero in there. Good thing to check every once in a while. And let's see, uh, one over this, I think 25. Yeah, 25. 
So we end up with 25 T. And sweet, we're done, right? We have our five microfarad capacitor. We have our 20 K resistor. So we have our 20 K. And we were asked to find the potential difference between the bottom of the circuit, we'll call that, uh, we'll just ground that side, and right here, call that A. And now we notice that we have an expression for the potential difference across the first capacitor and once we're there, we can go across the second capacitor. And so at the end of the day, we can say that, excuse me, that's a terrible color choice. Let's go back to our red, Christmas. We can say that V naught as a function of T, remember we were calling this V naught. V naught as a function of T, is the potential jump across the one microfarad capacitor plus the potential draw jump across the second capacitor. Pretty cool, huh? All right, well, let's go ahead and get another problem. So let's go ahead, that's, that's the capacitor bit. Let's go ahead and get some more practice with the inductor. So go ahead, take a moment, figure out what's the current running through the inductor after the switch is opened. You got it? Yeah, good, good, good. Okay, so again, let's go ahead and consider first of all the initial situation. That's to say time less than zero. And at time less than zero, we again have our potential supply. We have our three ohm resistor. We have our six ohm resistor. We have our 30 ohm resistor. And again, we need to ask ourselves, what's the behavior of an inductor when it's fully charged? We already mentioned that a fully charged capacitor acts like a break. We can just remove that wire from the circuit. An inductor acts like a wire. Okay. So at this point, once we get to our inductor, we can put a wire in, straight wire. And of course, because that represents a short in the circuit, we don't have to put in that two ohm resistor. We don't have to consider that two ohm resistor on the left, the right hand side, excuse me. We can just completely ignore that. All right, well, hopefully you see here that the current running through the right hand portion of the circuit is just a current divider. The current flowing through the 6 ohm resistor will be the same current flowing through the inductor. And we have a current divider situation. And again, you could apply KVL or KCL or node voltage, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? I just see it and I know that this is a current divider. So that's how I'm going to solve it. Okay. Okay, so well, we have a situation. I'll go ahead and get my REQ going. So we have something like our two resistors in parallel plus our resistor that's in series. And so what do we have here? We have So this is eight, we have something like eight ohms. So in before time is equal to zero, right back in the past, okay, we have that our current flowing through this circuit is going to be V over this 80. 
or this eight, excuse me. I'll go ahead and put in numbers on this one. So 120 divided by eight is 15. This is 15 amps. And now at this point, I have my current divider, right, that I mentioned. The 15 amps gets split. Two thirds will go through, or excuse me, I said two thirds. Uh, one sixth will go through the 30 ohm resistor and five sixths should go through the six ohm resistor. And I know that, again, that's just an application of KVL and KCL, but I know that what this will end up being is R30 over R30 plus R6 times the total current. So that's where the, the 5, 6 comes from, 30 divided by 36. And so what I end up with here is 12.5 amps. That is the initial current running round this short, which is where the inductor is located. And don't forget, the inductor acts like a perfect wire once it's fully charged. Hey? So we've now solved the initial conditions. And where this sometimes runs in incidentally is I'm doing it in terms of initial conditions, but you could also say that this gives you the upper and lower bounds if you're doing an integration. Okay. So if you're doing an integral, you know, something with DT and uh, maybe a DI at some point, when you put in time is equal to zero, you'd wanna put in that 12.5 as the lower limit. And then you'd have to figure out what to put for the upper limits. So bear in mind, we're still doing that. It's just that I'm presenting in a slightly different fashion. Well, let's go ahead and decide how to treat this circuit once the switch is opened. We'll get rid of this, get rid of this rigmarole. And you'll probably notice, I'll go ahead and use this lower right-hand side. Once the switch is opened, we have the situation where we have the eight millihenry inductor and the two ohm resistor. And so now we can go ahead and just apply KVL, KCL, and we have that the potential jump across the inductor equals the potential drop across the resistor. And I, again, I apologize. I always, I generally fall into just using capital letters for everything. Okay, so please forgive me for that. And now we go ahead and substitute in our expressions for the potentials across each of these circuit elements. So for the resistor, we just have IR. And for the inductor, we have to be careful here. We have L, we have our DI, DT. And here's the place where I always forget, there's that negative sign in there. And what does that negative sign mean again? it comes from Lenz's law. That negative sign tells us that whatever the change in current is doing, the inductor acts the opposite way. So imagine for a moment, when you open this switch, the current flowing through the inductor wants to start decreasing, it goes down. The change in current is negative. That means that the inductor will try to increase, provide a positive potential. So currents decreasing flowing through the inductor, that means the potential will hopefully increase, right? It wants to drive current to prevent that change. Okay. So at this point, we're all fine and dandy. Of course, if you notice, if you ignore that negative sign, you'll get an exponential increase for the current. So we go ahead and we do our separation of variables that we covered in the previous video. 
And we should end up with something that says the current as a function of time will be equal to the initial current times e to the negative. And here again, we have to be a little bit careful. I always bog, bog all that up in my head a little bit. Uh, let's see here. So we should get something that says r over l times t. And of course, we already know our initial condition, right? The initial current running through my inductor is 12.5 amps. And notice that it's from top to bottom. In other words, the direction opposite that indicated on the figure. So technically, I should put in a negative 12.5. So we have our IT equals negative 12.5 amps e to the negative R over L times T. And we're done. There we go. And again, once we have that, you say, well, what happens if I want to find the rest of the stuff? Yeah, that's fine. Once you have the current, you can find the potential drop across the inductor. Right? If you know the current, you can find the potential drop. And in fact, as a byline, that goes for pretty much any of our circuit elements. Right? If you know the current, you can find the potential drop. Or conversely, if you know the potential drop, you can find the current. That's what some of these equations help us do. Ohm's law, for example, okay. or our potential drop across the capacitor, okay. or our potential drop across the inductor. And notice I've written these all in terms of I's current. Charge is the integral of the current. That's what I did in the second one there. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, well, let's go ahead. Let's run another example problem. Hey, all right. So again, we have a situation. Now notice we have a current supply and at time is equal to zero, the switch is at position A. Incidentally, just in case you run across the terminology, this is a single throw double pole switch. Okay. You might see it as abbreviated as STDP, single throw double pole. Okay. All that means is that there's one hinge, but two positions. This is in contrast to say like a double pole. I think it's called a double pole double, double throw double pole switch. And I believe what happens there is there's actually two switches, which each can be in two different locations. And you know, there's, I'm sure there's a bunch of other combinations. Okay. So go ahead, take a minute and consider the situation, solve the problem. When we move the switch from position A down to position B. And in particular, we're interested in the potential drop across that 10 ohm resistor. You got it? Good, 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 good. Well, let's go ahead. Initial. So initially, and again, I always find it helpful to draw the circuit in. Initially, what we have is something like this, where we have our 10 ohm resistor, we have our six ohm resistor, and again, our four ohm resistor. And that inductor acts like a brake. So this four ohm resistor, oops, can just go away. We don't need that four ohm resistor. And what do we find? Well, now we definitely have a current divider and so that we see that the initial current running through our inductor 
is just gonna be that R10 divided by that R6 plus R10 times the current of our source. Right? So what does this give us? Uh, I guess if we wanted to simplify it, this is 5 eighths times 6.4 amps. Now afterwards, and this is really why I chose the problem. Afterwards, once the switch is opened, the situation that we now have is this. We have our 10 ohm resistor, our six ohm resistor. We have our inductor. We have our other resistor, our four ohm resistor. Okay. And now what I'm going to do, let's go ahead and think about applying KVL and KCL. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. And here we have a junction, I'll call it A, and applying KCL, oh yeah, I guess I better, if I'm gonna do KCL and KVL, I better draw in currents. So I'll call that I6, I'll call this I4, and I guess I'll call this one IL. Notice I'm using lowercase, these are time varying. And so KCL tells me that I should write something like IL equals I6 plus I4. So I have three unknowns, I need to have three equations. Well, let's go to KVL, KVL, and what can I write? I have the potential, I'll do the left-hand loop. So I have the potential jump across the inductor must equal the potential drop across the resistors. And similarly, I have for the right loop, the potential jump across the inductor is equal to the potential drop across the resistors. So now I have three unknowns and I have a set of three equations. Now here's really why I wanted to highlight the problem for you. In some sense, we could have just done a, an equivalent resistance and applied our usual stuff and been done. Okay. Okay. What I wanted to highlight for you here is notice that when I apply KCL and KVL, I do not have a set of linear equations. You say, what, why is that? Why, why aren't these linear? Notice, I have I's, the currents, but I also have derivatives of those currents. And derivatives are not a linear relationship. So I think I mentioned this at one point. I said, if your circuit only contains capacitors, or if your circuit only contains inductors, then these matrix operations that we've talked about are perfectly valid. You can go ahead and apply those. If it's a resistive network, then your unknown variables are gonna be the currents. If it's a network of only capacitors, okay, you have a potential supply, but you, you know what I'm saying, a capacitor network, then your unknown variables are gonna be the charges, the Qs on the capacitors. If you have a network of inductors, then your unknown variables are not gonna be the charges, they're not gonna be the currents, it's gonna be the change in currents, the di dt's. And you can treat each one of those, that entire quantity, as an unknown variable and then your equations will again be linear. The issue is, is that when we start dealing with these RC circuits, our equations are no longer linear, and so you can't apply those 
matrix techniques yet. So, so stay tuned. Those matrix techniques will come back because we're going to develop some additional mathematics that makes it easier. I want you to see the pain first, though. Okay, you're going to have to learn how to solve these differential equations, and then we'll learn, we'll see some of the shortcut methods, some math, throw in a little bit of math, stir it around, and then our matrix stuff comes back into play. Okay, just imagine. Dun 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 dun. Rim shot. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and solve this system of equations, and we're going to have to do it by sub and solve. We cannot rely on our matrix abilities. And hopefully you'll see why we go through, but one of the things that we should look at is the fact that we have time derivatives here, okay? and we don't have time derivatives in our KCL equation. So what am I going to do? How am I going to approach this? Let's go ahead and solve the bottom two equations from KVL for I4 and I6, and then we will go ahead and substitute it into our KCL equation. So what do I get? So I have my KCL equation, IL equals I4 plus I6. And now I will rearrange my KVLs and plug them in. So what do I have? I have negative L dil dt, and that is divided by r4. In addition, I have a negative l r6 plus r10, and I have that dil dt. Of course, if I pull that common term out, right, the uh, I'll leave it like this, IL over DT, put the negative sign in there, and then we have this L over, excuse me, that's a big L, say L over R4 plus L over R6 plus R10. And hopefully you see a couple of suggestive things. You're on the right path, right? Look at this. If I look at just the resistor values, you notice that I'm adding resistors in inverse, just like we would with our combining resistors method. The second thing I'll point out to you is notice that you have L divided by the resistor. That looks a little bit like the time constant for the circuit. Remember that for an RL circuit, the time constant is defined as L over R. Okay. Well, let's keep going. Of course, right now, you hopefully realize that we again have a separable equation. I can move the I to one side, the DT to the other, and integrate to solve this sucker. Right. We have this rigmarole out in front. So uh, so what do I get here? I get L over R4 plus L over R6 plus R10. And now you notice I'm moving it to the other side, so I'm going to invert it. Okay, now we definitely have resistors in parallel. We have our DT equals, I'll stick the negative sign there, DT equals DI over I. So we already know the answer to this sucker. Uh, let's go ahead. I will just define this as the time constant, tau. And so we have at the end of the day that our current running through the inductor is the initial current e to the negative t over tau. Now, of course, yeah, you could substitute in values, and maybe we should. Uh, what do we have, like an 8? I'm mixing up my stuff now, 0.32. So we have our L as being 0 0.32 millihenries. No milla, 0 0.32 henries. And so we should be able to go ahead and do this. 
um, we have L times 1 over 4 plus 1 over 16. So the negative 1, and that L's to the negative 1 as well. Negative sign out front. And so what do we get here? Uh, 4 sixteenths plus 1 sixteenth. So we get something like L 5L over 16 to the negative 1. Well, we have this 0.32 here. So that gives us 5 times, I'll put 32, times 10 to the negative 2. Right, that's 0.32 divided by 16. Oh, and now we see why they did the why they gave us what they did. Oh, incidentally, remember that whole thing's inverted still. Forgot that negative one. So the 32 cancels the 16. So we get two, and five times two is 10. So the two and the five cancel one of those suckers. And so I get 10 to the negative one raised to the negative one, which is equal to 10. So if I'm not mistaken, we get something like tau is 10. And of course, we have the initial condition from our initial analysis. So we have something like 12.5 e to the negative 10 over 10. And there is the current flowing through my inductor. Don't forget we were dealing with L, the inductor. So if we're after the current flowing through our 10 ohm resistor, we now have a situation where we just have a current divider. We have the current being provided by IL, and it can either go through this path or that path. And so I will leave it here on the screen, but the current through the 10 ohm resistor or if I prefer the potential drop, V naught is equal to that, this would be equal to our R10 current division, which would tell us that we have R4 over R10 plus R6 plus R4. Then I would multiply by my inductor current. And we're done. Cool, huh? Sweet. Okay. Yeah, so I think this video has gotten long enough for this time. Uh, I'll do another video with some more examples, and we'll start moving into the RLC circuits and, as well. Uh, so, hey, thanks for your attention. I'll see you next time.